Yes, yes. All right. Well, I think we're about ready to get started. So first, let me welcome everyone to this panel today. I am, ex I am very excited to be able to, to moderate. Um, I'll probably add a couple of my two cents in, but really we want to hear from the other panelists, our esteemed panel that, is, that has gathered here today. So first, let me introduce myself. I'm M. Roger Holland. I am a teaching assistant professor here at the Lamont School of Music, University of Denver. I am broadcasting to you from one of our concert halls here at the Newman Center for Performing Arts. I am in the Hamilton Recital Hall here on our campus. In the background, you can see our organ there. That is the William K. Kors organ by Berlin's Karl Schuke, consisting of 41 stops with 56 ranks, 2,848 pipes, six couplers, a sub-octave coupler for swell, and 4,000 general combinations with sequence pistons. For those who wanted to know, it is a gift from the Coors family. I just, I know there were inquiring minds and some organists back here. They were like, what is, what, 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 what? So now you know, now you know. It's a wonderful instrument. So that's where I am. That's what we're doing. Um, just some logistical things before I introduce the rest of our panelists. I want to make sure everybody is aware of the chat room where you can send in some shout outs. Please do let us know. Some people have already done that. Uh, where you're tuning in from, we would love to know that. Uh, also, please be aware of the Q&A feature here. And if you have questions, uh, please feel free to uh, uh, post them in the Q&A room and we will do our best to attend to any inquiries you may have today. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our esteemed panel to all of you who have come to join us today. First, let me introduce my dear, not all of these folks are my, are my good friends, some I've known a little longer than others, but Dr. Rosephany Dunn Powell, I have known for years. We were at Westminster Choir College together. And uh, Dr. Powell has been hailed as one of America's premier women composers of choral music. Dr. Powell serves as a Charles Barkley Endowed Professor of Voice and conducts the Women's Chorus at Auburn University. Additionally, she serves as a conductor of all state and honor choirs around the country. Everybody, please welcome Dr. Rosephany Dunn Powell. Oh, uh, by the way, uh, this is just a dis a disnomer, uh, disclaimer right here. Misnomer, dis no, disclaimer. So I might get a little excited because I'm amongst my, my folks right here. So I'm going to try to maintain my composure. But if I happen to go off, you know, on a tangent or off the deep end, I just want you to know that, you know, it's all good. I'll, but I'm going to try to control myself. Next, we have Dr. Brigida J. Johnson who is a jointly appointed associate professor of ethnomusicology in the School of Music and African American Studies program at the University of South Carolina. Her research interests include music in African American churches, musical change and identity in black popular music and community archiving. She has various articles that have been published in the Black Music Research Journal, Ethnomusicology Forum, Liturgy, Oxford, Bibliographies in African, Amer African American Studies, and the Grove Dictionary of American Music, and I could go on and on and on. Various panels, uh, uh, news outlets. Please welcome Dr. Brigida J. Johnson, everybody. Yes, 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 yes. Next, I want to bring to your attention Dr. Rollo Dilworth, who is Professor of Choral Music Education and Vice Dean at Temple University Center for the Performing Arts and Cinematic Arts in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He is an active composer, arranger, clinician, and researcher, particularly in the areas of African-American choral music, social emotional learning, community engagement, cultural appropriation, and social justice. Everybody, please welcome my friend, Dr. Rollo Dilworth. Yes, sir. And next, I want to bring your attention to my brother, my, my brother. We are Westminster alum, the Dr. 
Brandon Waddles. He is a conductor, composer, and educator, has enjoyed a multifaceted career spanning a multitude of genres. His breadth of experience extends from his award-winning work as a published composer arranger to his most recent tenure as music director for Grammy-nominated recording artist, Legacy, my brother. Dr. Waddles currently serves as director of choral activities at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. My brother, Dr. Brandon Waddles, please welcome ye him. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, this woman I met years ago and I wish she had been my music teacher because I would be a much better musician now if she had been in my formation. So, folks, I want to introduce you to Maestra Anne-Marie Hudley Simmons, formerly of Chicago, Illinois, has now been elected the 24th president, just finished serving her first year, as the 24th president of the National Association of Negro, Negro Musicians, incorporated at its centennial convention in uh, Chicago, Illinois, that took place in July of 2019. This is an organization that is dedicated to the preservation of music performed, composed, and or arranged by African Americans. In addition to that, Anne-Marie has served as director of music for New York City Public Schools, director of all city high school chorus, which concertized in Europe three years consecutively. She's the director of the arts for the Freeport School District, founder and first principal of the Performing Arts and Tech High School of Brooklyn, principal of the Columbus Avenue School in Freeport, et cetera, et cetera, and is an advocate for emerging artists and for the building of music education programs in public and private schools. My dear friend, Maestra Anne-Marie Hudley Simmons, please welcome her to the panel for today. So as you all can see, we have a very, very diverse panel. I'm excited to get down to, as some of us would call in the vernacular, brass tacks. So what I'd like to do now is just kind of set the stage for our discussion today. This discussion does not emerge, as I said a moment ago, out of the ether, but it is within a, within a specific context. So let, let me talk to you just a little bit, as I see it anyway, where this emerges from. So certainly, and this is not news, we are in the midst of a pandemic. Um, right around the middle of March of this year, most of us experienced this major shutdown around, around our country as we observed uh, stay-at-home orders for many locations here in the country. Uh, we were quarantined to our own homes for the most part. And for those of us uh, within the Black community, we experienced the pandemic within the pandemic, as many of us have referred to it. Uh, what I'm talking about is this uh, uh, racism, the uh, social uh, injustices that the black community in particular, but all communities of color have experienced for, for hundreds of years within this country. And so what happens is the pandemic, the, the COVID-19 pandemic exacerbated the effects of what we were already experiencing through racism in this country. Um, and the uh, pandemic, the COVID-19 affected communities of color disproportionately. And it specifically, it highlighted disparities in issues and areas such as healthcare, economic disparities, political, and so forth. In May of this year, however, um, there were three, really four in particular, I would like to highlight incidents of racial injustice. It started with the murder of Ahmad Aubrey. And what's interesting about that is the murder actually took place three months prior, but we became uh, nationally aware of this incident uh, about early May. And then following behind that, we got uh, bombarded with news of Breonna Taylor's murder, which still, we're still looking to, to, to see some kind of social action in regard to that, that, that is to say, for those who murdered her to be at least indicted, and we haven't seen that. And then the last week of March, so this is like one thing behind the other, the last week of March, we saw on Monday, May 25th, which is now seared into my memory, 
On that Monday, it was brought to our attention that a white woman in Central Park, New York, weaponized the police as Chris Cooper asked her to just obey the regulations in the park in terms of walking her dog. And she decided she would weaponize the police and threaten him with the New York City Police Department. And then that very same day, George Floyd was murdered, but we found out about it the next day. And the country watched in awe and horror as for eight minutes and 40 seconds, uh, 46 seconds, George Floyd perished before our eyes with a police officer who had his knee on his neck. So this is the trauma that the black community experienced in the midst of a global pandemic. As a result of this, Black Lives Matter emerged and erupted with calls for social justice, for racial justice in this uh, circumstance. And it wasn't limited to George Floyd's uh, uh, or that specific uh, location. This erupted into a global response and protest around not only the nation, but the entire world. And the responses have been equally as visceral. One of the things that we've started to see now that our country was experiencing this heightened awareness of racial injustice, it's not that these things weren't going on before, but as my sister, who's a professor at uh, Northeastern uh, University in Chicago said, because of the, uh, uh, the COVID, the coronavirus pandemic, we were in this kind of pressure cooker, you know? And so now it doesn't, it's black, white, all the different kinds of ethnic communities were responding to this. And now we see, we see various institutions responding to these issues of racial injustice. We see Quaker set to remove Aunt Jemima and Uncle Ben logos from, from, from their, 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 uh, their commodities. We see the NFL first spurred on by uh, NFL players, black NFL players demanding social justice, Roger Goodell taking back that, that statement about uh, NFL uh, players being able to kneel and now NFL unequivocally stating that black lives matter. And within this context, now we see academia also exhibiting a greater awareness regarding issues of diversity, equity, inclusion, and inclusion. And so, I just want us to have that at the forefront of our minds as we go into this discussion. Because once again, this has not emerged out of a vacuum. And now so many in our institutions, not only of higher learning, but other ins business institutions, higher ed as well as public school and so forth, are now thinking about these issues of diversity and inclusion. I think probably everybody on this panel has been approached multiple times asking you to speak about these things. And after a conversation I had with uh, uh, folks who are part of the GIA family a couple of weeks ago about issues of appropriation and diversity, I thought, how awesome would it be to bring some of my African-American, my black colleagues together and talk about these things and give our take, add our perspective in a very concentrated manner to this conversation. So that being the case, in that backdrop, let me now shut up and pose this question. I'm gonna drop it right here and ask you all to weigh in. Let's start with this. What does it mean to have an inclusive in, uh, environment in the choral world from our perspective, from your various perspectives? What does it mean when we think about inclusivity in the area of choral music? Any one of you, please just before I call on somebody. <laughs> Dr. Powell, I know you've been burning over there in the corner. You said, ah, 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 you're trying to contain yourself, please. I was really waiting for Dr. Dealworth, and he knows I was waiting for him. <laughs> but since you called my name, and, and I, I'm, a, I'm wondering if this is because of our Westminster relationship that I had to go first, but then Brandon should have been first. But since I am first, you know, I, I think all of us could approach this um, differently. Um, when, we're, when we're talking about inclusion and uh, diversity within the choral world, I'm, I would be approaching it, you know, um, as a composer in, in addition to one who's conducting. And for me, that would be that we need to see more of us 
as composers and as conductors. Uh, when, you, uh, when you look around um, at the um, conductors that are in, invited to be all state honor choir or other conductors, you know, again, we're, we're, there are very few of us um, who, and don't get me wrong, there are more of us than when I was in college and in high school. But I think, I still think our numbers are very few. And uh, I, I would go even further to say that they're very small for African-American women. So we have Af actually more African-American males who are serving as conductors. And then as a composer, we have even fewer African-American women who are breaking that glass ceiling in order to be composers or, or published composers of, uh, not let me go further, recognized public composers of uh, choral music. And, and I'll stop there and give someone else a chance. This is good. I'll be, I'll be, I'll go up next since I was called out. Um, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Powell. Thank you, Dr. Holland, and to the rest of the, the cast here. Um, when I think of um, inclusivity, I think in terms of parenting, and I think that parents are always looking to do better for their children than what they had. Um, so I always look towards the things that I didn't get when I was a student. Um, and I wonder now, as I start in this venture, especially at, at Wayne State in Detroit, um, I wonder about why certain things or why certain uh, elements of music weren't valued um, in the education process, especially in terms of choral work. Um, I wonder why in our choral conducting programs that we never took the time to value um, musical theater. I wonder how many, um, and, and when I think about that, I think about how many uh, burgeoning um, or inspired students could become music directors of major Broadway shows now if choral conducting programs had taken the time to look beyond, you know, classicized Western European repertoire. I wonder why um, we don't necessarily take the time, I mean, we have wonderful jazz vocal um, programs. Why, don't, why haven't we taken the time to teach singers about the value of being a background vocalist for an artist like Lettucey or in any um, particular genre? This is the type of inclusion that we need to be looking at because we're now in, um, we're just now in a different uh, uh, field and we're now in a different industry where our students um, need more than what we were doing 150 years ago. Because, you know, um, music education to me is not a one size fits all. It's not a it's not a onesie, um, and we have we have to get out of that mindset. Um, and we're we're headed now and uh, into uh, I, what I call the Darwinist concept, where so many are going to find themselves out of the loop because they cannot adapt to what type of inclusion we need for our students. Because it's not just about what we learned. It's what about it's what we have to bring to the people. So we have to get outside of the four walls of the church and start to minister in a different way. And I won't church too long. I'll leave that to somebody else. Amen. <laughs> I'm, I'm you know, you Dr. Know. Waddles, I, if I can just interrupt a moment there because of the direction that you, you or the doors that you opened, there were several doors. But I want to bring uh, Maestra Hudley Simmons into the conversation because I feel she is so uniquely poised to speak on this issue of inclusion and education that as you were speaking about and how some people have been, or many of our, we'll find many of our musicians unprepared for this new world of music making. Um, but Amory Hudley Simmons, as, as the, the president of NAM, the National Association of Negro Musicians, but also as a, a, a music educator, an educator for so many decades. What, what would you comment on, especially in terms of this idea of education and preparedness and can and so forth? Right. I want to piggyback on something that Brandon just brought to the table. One of the things that we want to embellish, enhance, and improve upon is how the National Association of Negro Musicians presents the music. We've been and we admire the classical music and the operas and the spirituals, and we will, we will never throw that out. But we say in our mission, in our mission statement, that we are going to embrace and enhance all of the music from the African diaspora, but we don't. 
we do nothing with, with the, how about the blues or, or the field hollers, jazz, ragtime, as you mentioned, uh, musical theater, uh, gospel. We, there, our music is the American music. We could write the history of our country through our music. And we, we can do it as, as an anthology, however we, we want to handle it. But one of the things that, that I need all of our members and all of our advocates and those who come to our concerts to understand is it's our music. If it's done well, and, and all music should be done well. I mean, you've heard probably an opera song and you say, oh my Lord, they're, they're, not, they're not in tune. They're pronouncing the words wrong. I mean, it, all music should be quality music. There should be that standard but we must be inclusive all across the board. I just want to do a backdrop, uh, take a minute, uh, Roger, to talk about my, my journey. Um, I'm from Chicago and I was the second of three children. My brother was a genius, my older brother was a genius and my younger brother was a genius and then there was me. <laughs> and, and I stuttered, I stuttered implicitly, I said it all the time. I don't think I really spoke a complete sentence until I was maybe the age of 11 or 12. But my brother, who was the genius, and back in those days, I'm, I'm the matriarch here, so you'll forgive me. Back in those days, we, everything was done by your IQ. And of course, he had a, a, a high IQ. But he studied the piano, he studied violin, viola, and, and the rest of it. When he would leave the piano, I would go to the piano and try to pick out everything that he played. And it was my mother, bless her, that who finally understood, wait a minute, all right, so she doesn't talk, she, she doesn't want to go to school. I, uh, I hated school before, that was a term called school phobia. So let's see what we can do with her, musically speaking. So I studied with um, Goldie Rhodes and I studied with Martin Kelly of Chicago. And all of a sudden, it opened up my understanding to math and to language. I and mean, here I am speaking Italian and didn't want to really speak English. What I gained from that, and of course, one of the things my mother said to me, because all of us in those days, by the way, were taking piano lessons. In my era, you were taking piano or violin, or you were singing. And I heard, uh, we were outside of Calvary Bible Church in Chicago, and a parent said to my mother, and I'm sitting in the car, isn't that amazing, the sacrifices we make for our children? And my mother said, sacrifice? This is no sacrifice. My child didn't ask to be born. I have to give my child everything my child can, can have in order to succeed in life. And I, I, I started crying right there in the back seat of the car because my knowledge of what my mother was saying. And when, when, when we got home, I said to my mother, when I grow up, I'm going to take care of you the way you took care of me. And my mother's response was, no, you take care of someone coming up behind you the way I took care of you. So as a result, since music was my passion, music deliver delivered me. I mean, I would have been a dropout of life had it not been for music. So I'm passionate about that delivery. And I believe that all of our students, because to me, they're all talented. They are all gifted and talented and black. And black is also a major talent if you understand how it was the blacks who built this country. That's another talent. So I made, I made certain that in my te teaching to include all the, I want my students to, you know, they, they sang. I had, had a choir with 275 junior high school students. And yes, they did sing the Requiem, Brown's Requiem, but they also sang, um, they sang your music, Rollo. <laughs> um, they, they sang music by, our own composers, they, they wrote blues. They, I needed them to understand what blues was all about. So they knew how to do a blues line. Uh, it was very important to me. And of course, the other thing of, of, it, of it was talking about the pandemic. To me, racism is the cancer that's eating our country. It was a pandemic way long before our present pandemic. Um, our forefathers had a lot to bear. And I'm glad that now with the cameras and all, we can see what's happening. But it was very important to me that our students understand you, you, you are black and beautiful and you can sing and do anything. So all the choral music that was out there, we made certain that our students had and they did it with excellence and they sang it at Carnegie Hall. It, was, it took a lot of pressure, but that's what we're all about. We as teachers, we press the point and we, we, make, we do the delivery. More later. Thank you, thank you. I, I certainly want to uh, make space for Drs. Dilworth and Johnson if there's anything you'd like to add to this. 
I think I would like to um, add a little bit more because we've had wonderful, great responses. We've heard about repertoire inclusivity from some of the panelists. I love to point about Inclu including and systematically including our, our uh, black female composers and conductors in these chains for choral education. And once again, I'm not a choral education or choral conducting specialist in ethnic colleges, but I also work in higher ed. And so when the kids come to my office and saying, why don't we have this? The point about musical theater came up in a meeting as well. Why, why when I want to do musical theater for my, my jury, I can't do it or if I do it, they don't pick it. And so these are things that students themselves already see. And so when we think about how do we make these things sustaining, um, long lasting, and also um, making sure that the parents know, because I think the point was raised about what do our students need, but also in music education, we see now parents saying, well, I know you have a passion for music, but how are you gonna get a job for that? So a lot of the responses are actually directly connected to employment issues. If your parents can see that you can be a conductor, a background singer, an arranger, a producer, because you have these skills that come with doing music, they will be more likely to say, go ahead and major or double major in music as opposed to just minor. Some of the best musicians I've seen at my institution happen to be minors because their parents said, well, I need you to go be a lawyer first. And their heart is not being in a lawyer. And so they try to be a lawyer, they become a lawyer, and they drop out of being a lawyer in 10 years because they weren't really connected to that on any kind of real level. But they loved music and they split, they split with music. However, the training that comes with that, they miss out on it because they didn't do it while they were in among that, that four year period, we can do anything, explore anything. So I think um, it's twofold, letting the parents know what we can offer. We have to proselytize our fields. We have music education, musicology, ethnomusicology, choral studies, all these things, and they all have jobs attached to them. When someone wants to put on a kumbaya public performance, they don't call a CEO to do it. They call a musician. They call someone who can do music direction. They call people to do that. And so as opposed to them calling a celebrity you know, musician who may not know how to arrange a choir, they can call your students. Mm -hmm. And so those are things that are tangible that we can do to help parents help us support the students, but also for our educators. Um, I see some of the chat conversations about how people feel about including repertoire. Most of that is an education issue. When people talk about appropriation or should we sing this or should we sing that or can we sing that, it's about a skill set. All of these genres of music have aesthetics, they have standards, they have ways of teaching them so they can sound like they're supposed to sound, so they can have um, excellence, as we say. Just like we have the pedagogy for classical music, there's actually pedagogy for all these other genres, particularly Black musical genres. So why are we not educating our students on how to teach these things? You should not be afraid to teach a Negro spiritual in the 21st century when you have people, choruses, choirs, directors, conductors, and composers that will tell you how to do it correctly. How do we um, teach beyond just tokenizing repertoire? We have books. I'm gonna hold up this Bible. This Bible is called The Music of Black Americans, a history, third edition by the one and only Eileen Southern. When you contextualize the repertoire of black music for students and educators, they understand that it's not just about the identity of the people doing the music, but also the context and why they were doing what they were doing. So we truly understand the context of gospel music and spirituals and all the other genres we provide. Even our black classical composer, we understand the context of what they were doing, why they were doing it, and why it was important. You can translate that as an educator to your students. So they shouldn't be nervous about it. They should understand the context and what the composers and the artists were trying to do when they created these things. These things have already been done. This book came out in the 90s. And if you see all my little, my little it's still viable, still viable. They call it the Bible because you can go back to it. And it's, it's all very much there. We have clinicians on the screen. If you do not understand as a conductor how to teach your students spirituals or any of your genre, musical theater, gospel music, contemporary gospel music, you literally can Google somebody of expertise and have them come and do workshops and webinars and seminars. That is how we see the explosion, for example, of, of gospel music in Japan. They're just not singing the CDs and tracks. They're bringing Richard Smallwood to Tokyo. They're bringing Hezekiah Walker to Tokyo. When you see South Korean gospel choirs, they are touring and coming to African-American churches to be in the cultural context. And so they go viral because they sound great because they have studied the genre as opposed to just stayed in the fan zone of the genre. The Netherlands, one of the largest gospel, you know, uh, festivals in the world every year. 
backpacks and international people doing gospel around the world because those cultures have taken the time to institutionalize education of gospel music, the pedagogy of teaching it, as well as performing it at high levels. We can do that in America as well. So there's really, at this point, is really no excuse for it. We have the connectivity, so we must basically push ourselves to just to go do the work at this point. Powerful. Powerful. I, I can't begin. So, Dr. Doe, well, we haven't heard from you yet, but I want to I want to uh, take off from something that Dr. Johnson had had mentioned and start with you, sir. Um, so, my question uh, that that falls in line with much that Dr. Johnson just uh, spoke and shared with us is, what about the assumption, therefore, of the primacy or the supremacy, if you would? of Eurocentric music and the tension of this presumption when juxtaposed with music from other cultures and really specifically when music uh, juxtaposed with music from the Eurocentric canon. How do we engage with that, Dr. Um, Dilworth? Wow. That's a loaded question. Thank you, Thank you Professor Howard. <laughs> That's a loaded question. Well, I'll, I'll do my best to, to give some perspective on it. Well, first and foremost, uh, I'm just so grateful for all of my colleagues on this panel and all of, of what they've had to say is uh, food for thought and is, gives us a recipe for action uh, moving forward. And now, talking about the Eurocentric perspective, uh, specifically when it comes to choral music, but certainly in general, we have to sort of realign our, our thought process because the European perspective on music and musicking has really been one in which we tend to value and measure and evaluate every other form of music that is non-European. And so the European perspective has not only become sort of, this canon has not only become central to what is going on in our curricula across uh, the United States, but it has become a tool by which we measure the quality of other genres of music, particularly uh, music uh, of, of Black Americans or music of the African uh, diaspora. Um, I think that this whole um, uh, situation that we're in now with, with COVID and social justice sort of, you know, at, at its intersection has really caused us to look very carefully at what is the root of the issues related to social uh, 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 injustice in the United States, uh, particularly towards people of color, particularly towards African Americans. And I'm, I'm challenging all of my colleagues these days to really look at the root of choral music and how it got started here in the United States. And knowing that, we can, we can more clearly understand that choral music circa 1837, 1838 in the United States was never initially designed to be inclusive of experiences beyond the Western canon. And if we take an honest look at that and, and come to terms with that, it will help us to understand why it is that even now in 2020, we are still struggling with this, with this issue. I gave a presentation a, a week or so ago with the California Choral Directors Association, and I told them that, you know, in 2020, why is it that the Harvard, the new Harvard Dictionary of Music, in its definition of choral music, continues to exclude the contributions of Black Americans? In fact, not only does it exclude the contributions of, of us from the African diaspora, it actually takes elements that are rooted in the African diaspora and attributes them to Western and Eastern and Central European composers. Now, if you don't believe me, I'm gonna read something for just a moment. And I want everybody to go to their Harvard Dictionary of Music and look at the last two paragraphs, the last paragraph of the definition of choral music. And this is supposed to be a highly researched bibliographic entry. This is what it says. It says amateur choral singing, which in the United States includes the choruses in virtually every secondary school, college, and university, and most church choirs, has created an even greater market for varied choral music, which however is often more conservative in style and modest difficulty. Now here's the point I'm going to make. This is how it concludes. Some composers have made radical innovations at times through the influence of folk material, as in the percussive chanting invented by Stravinsky in Les Nances, later adopted by Orff, 
or through avant-garde choral techniques such as shouting, whispering, tone clusters, and glissandos, as in Christoph Penderecki's St. Luke Passion. So you hear in this scholarly reference uh, book that we all look to in order to understand the definition of not only choral music, but other uh, musical terms, we have a definition that excludes the contributions of people from the African diaspora and actually attributes some of those contributions like the wailing and the percussive singing to European composers and goes on to even say that, that they were invented by these people. So if we don't come to terms with the fact that choral music was never designed in this country to include us to begin with, we can, it's not until we admit that, until we can then move forward and understand why inclusion is something that we continue to lobby for, why inclusion is something that is very necessary, and why inclusion is something that has to happen now, if it's ever going to happen, um, because historically we have not been included. Look at the Star Spangled Banner. Why are people taking a knee? The third verse of the Star Spangled Banner talks about slavery. And people to this day wonder why there are folks, black folks, and not and people who are not black who are still who still have issues with that piece of music being taught in our schools and even being used at our sporting events. I'm not here to say it has to go, but I'm here to say that we have to be honest and tell the truth, and and be honest in that choral music from its outset in this country was not designed to include us, which is why we are to this day still having that struggle. So that's what I want to say. I think that's where we have to start. If we can start there and admit that, and there's all sorts of evidence beyond what I just gave to support that, it is only then that we can begin to move forward and have these honest conversations and do better, as, as Dr. Maya Angelou used to say, when you know better, you do better. Wow, wow. Does anybody else on the panel care to respond? Because I have so many things. We're not gonna get to everything this hour, but would anybody care to respond? Thank you, thank you, Rollo, for that. That was, that was incredible. Um, so much to think about. The word has gone forth. Amen. Amen. And I would like to add to that uh, what uh, Rollo is saying that uh, I'm, I'm so moved by what he said, I'm having a hard time finding my thoughts. But when you think about that African American music, so called folk songs, are the first true American songs. They're, they're what we're fighting against, and I think Ms. Simmons addressed this too, if, if, we're, if our music was the first true American song, every other song was brought here from Europe, you know, from other, from other countries. Ours was the first uniquely born here in America. There has to have been a special effort to disregard what is uniquely American. And I think uh, Dr. Johnson talked about what is, it's, it's, uh, I think I even saw it in the comments from um, uh, someone addressing uh, Dewala Simmons saying, this is American music. Our music is uniquely American because it was born here, whereas the European music was brought here. Why would not we choose to lift up our own music. And especially when Dr. Johnson was talking about, yes, you know, I, speaking as a composer, so much of my music is better performed in Asia and Africa than it is here in America because of the respect that they have for our music. And I think that's the issue is that it is not respected the same way as when you think about poets such as Langston Hughes and others, they were going to Europe in order to, to, to write. And even our jazz musicians, everybody was going to, to Europe where they were respected while we were still treated as non-human beings here. So there's so much history mm -hmm. that I don't think we even want to share the history in order for us to have this inclusion. The history has to be addressed. And, and, and I think that's, those are the difficult conversations that, that we don't want to have is to say 
what has happened here in America and how do we change that for the positive and the main way to do it is stop. I, 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 another thought's coming to me. At one point, I became frustrated because in jazz studies, I would be in, in, in conferences or in classes and you would think that white people invented jazz. <laughs> Because the, from the way it was being taught, it was Benny Goodman, it was all these people who were not black who were actually stealing from us, who were getting all of the recordings. And so you had students walking around, peers of mine, speaking as if jazz came from non-blacks. So I think we, we, we and, and you're even reading in some history books, the focus will be more on white musicians than on the black musicians. And the white musicians were going up into Harlem and other places to spend time with the black musicians, but they're getting the recording contracts in addition, you know, to a few select uh, black composers and bands. So I think we, we've got to tell history the way it really occurred and then decide that based on that history, we want to make things right. This, this, this discussion needs to be like two hours. Go ahead, Dr. Johnson. <laughs> and to, to, to piggyback that point, because a lot of times we have people, and I see it in the kind of comment section, well, how do we do it? How do we do it? Why? So I like to give the, the why and how. And also by examples. I mentioned gospel music in Japan, and specifically Tokyo, for a reason. Um, in 2013, um, a actual article was published by Waseda Monaco. She's a Japanese scholar. And the title of the article is Gospel Music in Japan, Transplantation and Localization of African-American Religious Singing. So right off the top, they're acknowledging this gospel is African-American in the origin. But in that article, she talks about what happens when you go to Tokyo and you go to a Yamaha school. We know about Yamaha schools. You go there, in addition to buying a piano or whatever, you can actually get keyboard lessons, you can get guitar lessons. In some of the Yamaha um, schools in Tokyo, they also have gospel choir. So you can do piano, guitar, choir, and specifically gospel choir. She talked about also in some of the schools where actually gospel is now a category. So you have your compulsories, you have a separate category, and so you can actually go to an actual choral event and, and perform gospel in the aesthetic, not be one of many and maybe do it, whatever. It's actually something. They actually have an industry, sheet music, translating gospel music into Japanese and vice versa. And so you see them systematically respecting it, including it in actual pedagogy, as well as repertoire, and the, and the students can perform it. You have university students doing gospel. So when you think about what we can do here, if you're in a school, and this is going back to that point about when you go to a class and there's no history taught about jazz, and so everyone thinks it's white music, when you are a choral conductor and you're in a university setting, look in your music department. Is there an actual history course for the music you're trying to teach? Because oftentimes they say, well, we don't have time to do the history because we have to make sure we got the aesthetics and the performance and articulation and all this and learn the words. That's a heavy load to carry. So when you are programming that semester, look around. Is there a music history, a musicologist, or anyone offering courses in this music so that you can send your choir students, majors, minors, non-majors, whatever, to those classes and say, you need to go here to learn the, the, the background of the aesthetics. Why does the sound sound this way in gospel music? It's not just because people are emotional or they have trauma and uh, oppression. These are actually formalized ways of performing the African-American musical aesthetic comes from some other context. And you learn about that context, hopefully, in these musical history courses that uh, not only just do dates and facts, they also look at the aesthetics of where they come from. How can I tell listening to a Chicago gospel artist versus someone who may come out of Detroit or New York or West Coast sound? These all things, just like we break down the classical periods and there's a Baroque attach or Baroque a way of playing violin versus a classical or high classical way of playing violin. When we actually teach our children, if you're gonna play a romantic piece, you do legato this way versus a Baroque piece. We do exactly the same thing for black music genres. And you learn those things in those classes that look at the history as well as the aesthetics. And so if you are an educator, you need to be looking, hey, go to the faculty meeting. Do we have anyone teaching these courses? Why not? We haven't hired them. Why not? They're out there. We have graduate students with these degrees. These are the jobs that need to be filled, not just hire me a black musicologist. Hire me someone who actually knows this music, who actually knows these genres, who can actually sit down and say, here are all the black composers we have who just do, who do things beyond just arrange spirituals again. 
we actually have black composers doing modern music who need to have a platform who are winning awards and being recognized around the world but the students right here in america don't even know who they are so that's, that's an issue that can be solved when we have collaboration between our walls within schools of music and music departments. Is these are things that can literally be done because we've seen it done elsewhere. We've seen it done in other countries where there are basically barely any black people walking around. So if they can figure it out in Tokyo, Japan, in America, it should be easy. Woo. All right, I want to piggyback off the Dr. Johnson and Dr. Powell and there's a question, and I mentioned at the beginning of this conversation, that, that is prevalent in so many of our circles about appropriation. I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to hold my mouth about, my tongue about a couple of things about appropriation. First, I, I just want to say this, and then I want to open the floor. At the root, I believe, of appropriation, and not just me, many, many scholars have said this, if we want to address the issue of appropriation, we have to get down, and Dr. Johnson and Powell, you said this, respect. It's about respect acknowledging the source communities and doing the research. And what I happen to be confounded by, by so many of my very learned colleagues, why is it that they don't get the idea about research? You'll research that, that German piece, you'll research that Chacon, you'll research that Madrigal, but somehow or other, when it comes to our music, you're baffled that you don't understand that research is a part of the preparation. Why is it that that seems foreign? All of a sudden, we don't know about research. So research, respect, do the preparation, and now you're prepared to do this piece from a place that is informed, right? So certainly, if you all have anything to add on, on appropriation, but that, that's my nutshell. That's how you address preparation. That's how you can perform this music and not feel like you're appropriating and you're doing a disservice or you're being disrespectful. But there's been a practical question that's been asked in the chat. Um, certainly if anybody else on the panel wants to add to appropriation, but I think that's the crux of the matter. I think we've already touched that. The question was this, what are some things that contemporary choral ensembles can do to address the systemic barriers that make it difficult for black composers, conductors, uh, and singers to enter, feel comfortable, and to thrive? And I think it's tied to this issue of um, appropriation. But please, somebody. Yeah, I, I just, I'll jump in again. I think it has to do with really sort of breaking down this, this Eurocentric lens through which we evaluate and we measure uh, what it means to be a musician. Uh, we define musical literacy by, you know, one's ability or lack thereof to read uh, uh, the five lines in four spaces with fluency. And as we know uh, from our traditions uh, in, in, uh, in the African-American church in particular, there, and in blues and in jazz, we have lots of musicians who are, who are beyond what we would consider literate. They just may not uh, be people who read off of a printed page. And so I think number one, we have to, to redefine what that means. I think we have to redefine what it means to, um, to bring one's voice and one's self and one's being to the music making experience. Because again, I think that that, uh, for me as a black person, that is often defined by how well I hit the mark in terms of my understanding of the, the, the European way of doing things. Um, I think it's a lens that we simply have to take off of our faces. And, and what I love about Dr. Johnson's field of ethnomusicology is that the playing field is a little different in that, you know, all music is looked at with, with value. And, 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 and fairly the same amount of value. Now people may have their preferences and their specializations within eth ethnomusicology, but in the classical world, it's Western European classic is, is reign supreme and then everything else falls under that as being considered the other. And until we stop otherizing music that is not of the Western European canon, we will never reach that, that point of breakthrough where we will be able, I think, to really to, to respect the music and, and to not appropriate. Um, again, last week, you know, when I was talking to California choral directors, I, you know, I, was, I felt like I was preaching a sermon a little bit, but I, was, I, I literally talked about what our field has taught us and how we need to break 
those those that that sort of I don't want to call it brainwashing, but in many ways we have been in some ways as far as what we see as the this Western European tradition being the the gold standard by which we measure everything else. So you know I am going to look at some of my points here from my from my little sermon, but but tell me if I'm wrong here. Our field has taught us to view Gregorian chant as normal, while at the same time viewing Native American chant as novelty. Our field has taught us to view Italian recitative and German Sprechstimme as musical speech, while at the same time viewing rap and hip hop as not being music at all. You know, what is, what is with that? In, in 2020, I had some more points there, but I just want to give you two of them. So if we don't change that mindset that, that we have been taught in, in, in the conservatory and that we're teaching our students, we will never get to this breakthrough point in which we're able to really actualize what we're calling inclusion uh, in, in the music making uh, arena. And I'll be quiet. Yes. Jesus. Yes. Yeah, I, this is, this is go good. Tamarine. Keep on playing. Keep on playing, Dr. Dilworth. I'm going to get my tambourine. Keep on playing. <laughs> this hand is shaking. This Baptist. <laughs> so I, I think there's a book that I, I, I have to recommend here. And, and when I do sessions on um, African-American music, African-American sacred music, and this book is not necessarily dedicated to music at all. But um, uh, Ibram Kendi's uh, Stamped from the Beginning, A Definitive History of Racist Ideas in America, is a powerful, powerful text. And I think we've discussed this on several occasions, um, but the system itself was not designed for us. Right. And we must all be very aware that's of the reality of slave mentality. And that plays so far into, um, like Dr. Dilworth talked about, our, our categorizing this totem pole of music and its importance. Um, I had a good friend here, uh, Professor Brittany Boykin, I saw her in the uh, uh, thread, and she talked about intentional conversation. Um, you know, I, I can't imagine how many consultations that we've all uh, had that we probably need to be charging for asking the same questions. Um, but we need to be having more intentional conversation in our classrooms about the history and why we are where we are in terms of having to, to reorganize ourselves, our thinking about the, the importance of this music, um, our music in particular, black music. Um, I, I think that this is important. I, I, I really do believe that in a way that this, this pandemic and coronavirus has done a great deal for us because we're having to change a lot of things. Um, and my big concept, and this is in terms of education in general, that we need to be focused more on the process rather than the product. We think as choral educators about how we do, um, we spend so much time just trying to get a concert together. Well, it looks like we won't be in a performance space for, for too long. So why don't we focus on the, the good stuff, you know? So why, why, why don't we talk about, why don't we teach the history? If we're not seeing it happening, take the time to research and, and let's talk about it here. Let's, if you don't know it, let's bring in somebody. Let's, let's, let's hire them out to, to, to have these conversations. But we have got to be more focused on, on fostering the, the importance of music education on, on all levels, on all levels. And we have got to realize that the system itself, the right. system itself was, was created and designed to, for just what Dr. Dilworth was talking about, exclusion. Mm -hmm. That's right, Ms. Simmons, exclusion. So this is, yeah, all important stuff, great. So then let me ask another question that's going, coming from this conversation. We have systems in place and we're talking about process and we're talking about intentionality. So my question with that is, is this, which I would love to hear your perspective on uh, panelists. Gatekeepers and how we can engage in this process of intentionality. Brandon, I'm, I'm fully with you, sir, that I think this coalescence that has, that we find ourselves within the pandemic 
and, and now how we engage. It's forced us to do things differently and it has heightened all these various things. And so now people are listening People want to know, at least there, you know, there seems to be an open-mindedness, whereas, you know, black folks have been lynched for decades and nobody seemed to care. But when it was put in front of their face for eight minutes and 46 seconds, all of a sudden now, wow, this is a thing. This has actually been happening. And so now there seems to be this growing awareness and people seem to be open to having these conversations. We're saying there must be intentionality. You wanna know how to program it? I saw Brittany's comment as well. You need to be intentional about programming it. You need to be intentional about having these conversations. You need to be intentional about putting this, in, this content in your courses. So the question then becomes for me, how do we put it in the courses? Because, uh, you know, as someone in academia, as, as, as you all are, we know that we singularly, except for within the realm of our own classrooms, don't necessarily have the full scope of authority. And so who are the gatekeepers and who gets to decide? I'm thinking about this. One of my colleagues here at the university has a book called Good Music, What It Is and Who Gets to Decide? Who Makes These Value Judgments? This is by John J. Scheinbaum. Good Music, What It Is and Who Gets to Decide? So that becomes the question for me. Who are the gatekeepers that make these decisions? Who are the people that are making these value judgments that keep music outside of the Eurocentric canon in place and in a place of prim, uh, uh, primacy and supremacy? And I say that intentionally. Can we talk, who, how can we be intentional? How can we keep, how can we help those who are in leadership positions to be intentional about making these changes? Because we're talking about systemic change, right? I'll jump in early because like I said, I'm, I'm not specifically from the choral world, but I have choral students. I think some of my best, actually some of my top students I've had on the graduate level have been choral conducting DMAs and they stay in contact with me. And so when we think about, you ask the question, who are the gatekeepers? At this point, we're talking about a culture of exclusion that's been indoctrinated through education. And so it's not one person or one thing. And so how do we address that? When you have your meetings with choral educators and choral conductors, your, your professional organizations and your journals, it's time to start talking about the elephants in the room. And so you have this idea that these types of music are less than, and then you've created these myths around these musics as well as singing these musics. And so I had one former student come in and tell me that at this person's job, that their colleagues told them, don't mentor those two black girls because they, they, you know, they sing gospel and so they're gonna ruin their voice so you're wasting your time. They won't be able to do this kind of music. He mentored them anyway. They went to the festivals, won rewards and prizes and people are, sh are shocked. And so you actually have people within with this culture of, you know, not only about the actual music and repertoire but also about black singers and musicians themselves. And so when we have people making up myths about male, black male singers and their voices and all these types of things. We know what they are, I'm not gonna say them. Some of them are very vulgar. We have a mixed crowd. So when in the, the vocal studies world, we address these elephants in the room about stereotypes, about the black voice, about black music and put them on front street and front street means in journal articles, in conferences, in plenaries. We saw some of us have seen with the music theory of journal, how they decided to attack a plenary, I say attack, and put out a special issue that was filled with racism. And now they're having to backtrack because the music theory world is saying, this is ridiculous. They are just as shocked. And they're saying, how could you do this? And so they're actually having to come to task with some institutionalized racism that was bold enough to publish a whole article, a whole series of articles in some cases that didn't even include the person they were addressing. And so the elephant in the room happens in our professional organizations, in our accreditation associations that's saying, you know, are we addressing these things? When we're noticing that we have black composers, but they're not showing up in the repertoire. They're not showing up in the list of songs that you can sing and perform. When we talk about hiring practices, I had one graduate student tell me, I want to do this topic, but I'm not sure I can do it because somebody said I might not get a job if I do it. What is, what is that to say? A student has an interest in a topic that's outside of the European canon or it's outside of traditional white male, hetero, Euro, whatever, and they were like, I want to do this, 
but they told me not to because like Mike can't get hired if I do this topic. What does that look like when we're telling our students and putting boundaries on our students in the 21st century around race, gender, sexuality? Who is the they? And so addressing those things and actually um, and having real conversations about that, what does that look like? Addressing the fear and the stereotypes that have been wrapped in institutionalized in a lot of our, our, our spaces in higher ed. When we talk about our K through 12 schools, one of the things that we have done intentionally was to contact those superintendents, the assistant superintendent in charge of instruction and curriculum, and then the superintendent in charge of operations because these people meet up and they decide what the budget looks like. Well, we can't have this in music because we don't have, uh, we don't have the money for it. So speaking with these people, and we've done this, we've already made a contact here in New York, our, our chancellor happens to be a musician. But because of the pandemic and because of, of moving monies around, they find another way to get around doing music uh, in general. But my concern is that you want your, you say that Black Lives Matter, it's, is it a poster? Is it a march? Or are we actualizing it by doing something about it? And since we do know most of our graduating classes, I, I believe, and this is across the country, the data shows that those students who have been immersed in music in general score higher. They're the ones, they're the valedictorians and, and the salutatorians. So if we can keep music in, in, in the budget, if we can get them to agree at least to the budget because they, they, music affects us. We are the ones who uh, get the most benefit, it seems, out, out of this pro process. Then the next step is, what does that music program look like? I think we have to talk to ourselves. Um, I know that Raul mentioned this, as, as did Brandon. I think we all mentioned this. The we. We have to uh, believe this ourselves. That has become a part of our core beliefs, that all of our music is important. Because I've sat with musicians of my own color, and they've said, oh, that, that's horrible. If they bring that kind of music in, then I'm, I'm getting out of that organization, because I don't want to hear any gospel or I don't want to hear any jazz. So we have to deal with ourselves. That's one part of it. What do we believe in and how do we think and how are we gonna make a change in our own mindset? And here again, it may be a carryover from, from slavery. A lot of things that we, we find in our culture are things we have not let go of, being supportive of each other. We've been taught to bang each other, knock each other down. So now we have to learn how to be together on, on various, uh, various uh, fronts. So all of this is a part of making that change. So when we value something and we bring it to, and I definitely believe with, uh, I've been talking to parent associations. So it was interesting, Brandon, that you mentioned that earlier. Parents need to understand music is not just nice for children, it's imperative. And then the kinds of music that we bring to our, our children, it's gotta go across the gamut. They've got to know about themselves. When they know about themselves, that builds what? The self-confidence, the self-respect, the appreciation for others, et cetera. Wow. All right, I tell you what, we have about mm, 10 minutes left. <laughs> this could be a three hour conversation. Let's, let's talk, take a look at some of the uh, questions that have been brought up in the Q&A. Um, so in the opinion of the panelists, what would be the primary resources you would point current practitioners and uh, pre-service public school teachers to in order to understand the most appropriate pedagogical strategies for music within the African diaspora, in addition to bringing in experts such as all of you here present today? What are some practical resources? And GIA is gonna answer this question. So maybe we can move on, amen. Thank you, GIA. You all are the bee's knees. Um, I think also, I think just to let the audience know, um, they are gonna also, some of the resources we want to share with the audience, GIA is also gonna take those as well. Um, some of the historical references, we'll, we'll give them a list. We're giving them a list. And so they will be also posting those things. Um, it's like so-called primary resources you can consult. We will be giving those to them as well. So it's coming. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. This is an interesting question. Um, I have my own thoughts, but I'm going to stay in my moderator place. Question, 
about white composers arranging Negro spirituals? Thoughts? Well, that was one I was going to address earlier. And it's the, for me, it goes back to what we've been talking about, and that's respect, and that's research. Um, two things. One, I, I think that there are so many African Americans who are arranging spirituals, and at times I take offense that their works are being rejected by publishers, while non-Blacks who are arranging them without a respect for the culture and the form. And I'll give you some examples. I've heard uh, non-Black compo uh, non composers and arrangers arrange spirituals and then we'll, we'll go throw in like the foot stomp of the Russian music or the, the popping of fingers. And, or there was one arranger who did something about the gospel train and had a woo woo, choo choo. It was so offensive. And yet the students who heard this, these performances were impressed because it was something that was different. And I actually had to school my own students to say that is offensive and had to go back and address historically with them because I'm at a predominantly white institution. And the African-Americans who even observed it thought that these, to me, uh, uh, ridiculous uh, and, and offensive uh, devices that they were using w w complemented the, 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 the songs. And that's even after uh, I had taught them about the spiritual. So I think if, if someone's going to arrange a spiritual, they need to do the homework yeah. of reading the resources uh, whether it's Eileen Southerns or Andre Thomas's or, or numer there, there are a number of resources on black music that if you, if you want to find it, it's so funny to me that you don't find people saying, well, where do I find the resources when I'm going to perform a Russian song? Where do I find the resources when I want to find a German song? But every time I do a presentation, people want to ask me, where do I find the resources? I think the respect comes in when you go search. And a lot of times you can just type it in on, on the, the internet. Why, why, why is it, 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 people seem to think our resources are not out there. It's because we, we, we don't value it enough to say, well, let me go search for this. And, and, and so I, I think if someone's going to arrange it, do the same research that you would do if you were going to arrange a Russian folk song or any other type of music. Do the research and don't do things that you just feel like, oh, that sounds good there. If, 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 and also listen to uh, historically the, the earlier arrangers uh, whether it's a Hall Johnson or whether it's uh, Dawson, go listen to what they were doing in addition to African Americans. And I, and I hope all of us African Americans are, are maintaining the respect for these works as well. But just don't, I, I just, anybody who's listening who, who wants to do arrangements, don't just go do what you feel. You know, do the research and, and make sure whatever it is is done respectfully according to our traditions. Yes, absolutely. I want to jump right on that because now that scenario she just described, those things are now going viral. And so now you have, I'm going to use the word, offensive arrangements and antics added to specifically those spirituals that are offensive because of how they go, not only outside the aesthetic, but outside the context. Most of these things are sacred songs. And so when you're trying to jazz up or gospelize or do all these other things, trying to do some kind of musicological experiment, you're not only out of tradition, you're disrespectful. You do not see people doing this to music of, of the Jewish, of Jewish churches and Jewish synagogues. You do not see people doing this in Islam. In Islam, some, in some places, doing this to music of Islam will get you literally killed. And so for some reason, people like to come to the spiritual tradition and run roughshod and do whatever because they don't want to do the research. They want to take the shortcut. And so now you're confusing the history. 
you're misrepresenting the genre, you're offending people's sacred music. People still sing these songs in churches today. So imagine the horror of opening up Facebook, Instagram, and seeing people doing a musical theater presentation with choreography and antics and acting on something that people literally worship to every week. Yep. So it has to be, the seriousness of the question has to go to that level. We talk about respect. Cause I know, I know, I know one of those instances I saw it and someone sent this to me and they were excited. I was like, are you serious? I was horrified by that because the students did not even know what they were doing. They did not know how far away from the tradition they were performing in an actual college course. So that's right. part of it. But then you think about the question that was raised about white arrangers doing this. If you cannot open up your choral, you know, uh, catalogs and your choral books and your resources and go to conferences and see black arrangements outside of one or two arrangers in the catalogs, you might want to step back because that means you're not recognizing your privilege. Because like she said, mm -hmm. white arrangers are getting published in publications and spaces in books where a whole several generations of black composers are still waiting to get even a call. So as a white arranger, if you can't walk into a room and see people who made this music already being celebrated, recognized, programmed, you might want to think about what, what your motives are at that point. Mm -hmm. I know you're creative and you want to get involved, but think about how your privilege is going to impact 10 other people who can't even get a look from a publisher because of who they are and not what they're doing musically. So those, those, those are two things, but really the seriousness specifically about these spirituals, we can go there with gospel as well, but specifically about the spirituals because we're talking about a core sacred work that literally got people out of bondage. Follow mm -hmm. the drinking gourd got people yep. physically out of slavery. And so you have to treat it with that same respect, yep. that same respect. These, these, all this sacred music that we talk about with Bach, and the Bach church music where he was composing every week for services. This was similar music, but it also was inside this context of trying to fight actual oppression. So if you're not respecting the genre, at least on a historical level, you know, really think about why you're doing what you're doing. Yeah, I, I just want to jump in and agree with everything that's been said. I know Dr. Waddles wants to jump in as well. I, I think that these distortions and these caricatures are absolutely appalling. And it's, it's not to say that a white person can't arrange a spiritual, but as Dr. Powell said, you must do your homework. You must study to show yourself approved. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go into scripture for a moment, but you, you must do that. And, and, and here's, the, here's the analog to that. Just as all of us were taught to look very carefully at a modern critical performing edition of an 18th century, you know, composer's work, and and these these modern these people who create these musicologists who create these modern editions, have these very extensive notes inside the score that talk about their research process and what the primary source materials were that they consulted. We need to have we need to hold arrangers accountable and publishers accountable for putting that same information inside of the music because there are many educators out there who go looking for a piece of music and they may not an arrangement of a spiritual and they may not even know better but if the person who is doing the arrangement indicates what their primary source material is, whether it's a field recording, and there are plenty of them that, you know, that Alan Lomax collected that are in the Smithsonian. You can go back to the Fisk collection of 1873. You can go back to the Hampton collection of uh, the year following of 1874. So there are primary source materials that one should consult in order to do this work and in order to do it well. And I'm holding everybody all of my colleagues, including myself, accountable for when an arrangement comes out, explain where it comes from, explain the cultural and historical context, explain your source materials. What changes did you make to the music, um, if you made any, in terms of the melody or in terms of the text or something? If you prove yourself to be honest and have that kind of integrity in your work, then people can look at that and make a decision for themselves based upon what you've written there and the research, research that you've done as to whether or not your arrangement is worthy of being performed in what I call a culturally valid or culturally authentic uh, context. Great. I might add on just one quick thing that if anybody is, is um, having trouble finding uh, black arrangers or spirituals, 
I believe you have about four here present in this panel list. And also I'm going to ask for Gerald Gray and Brittany Boykin to put down their websites because they have independent publishing um, and you can find them there and find their music. There's a freebie. Okay, great. Wow, this has been incredible. I am so grateful to all of our panelists. We're pretty much out of time and I wanna be respectful of, of not only the attendees time, but, but our panelists time as well. Um, and there are some restrictions on our time for this webinar. So uh, let, let me be timely. And first of all, let me, let me thank, uh, and I'm gonna go by first names because you all are so dear to me, Anne Marie, and Rollo and Rosephany and Brigida and my brother Brandon, thank you all so much. I am grateful because you said yes. And I feel honored that you came to be a part of this so valuable discussion. I also wanna thank uh, the people at GIA, um, Alec Harris and uh, Kate Williams, our facilitator here today, Matt Reichart. Uh, I want to thank my university, the University of Denver, the Lamont School of Music, uh, Chris Weger in, in public relations, and uh, Keith Ward, our director here at the university, and um, uh, Michael Furry in facilities that helped me to be here in the hall. All, all of you all that helped to make today uh, what it was. I am so grateful. All of you who came to attend this conversation today, it, is, it has been a very fruitful, insightful, and valuable uh, time that we have spent together. I wish we had another hour to delve into some of this uh, because it's just, it, there's just so much to cover and so much to be said. But uh, hopefully uh, people got some information. Hopefully you got some clarity. Hopefully you were challenged in a very positive way as we go forward. We, we need to now make this part of the conversation. This needs to be part of our discourse. This needs to be part of our instruction as we go forth. And uh, Dr. Johnson, you know I asked you here, I know you're not a choral person, but you are brilliant. And, and, and your perspective is so valuable here. So I'm so grateful for what you shared with us today. Thank you all for coming today and uh, go forth and do. Thank you, Roger. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roger. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. It's good seeing everybody.